get a few practical pearls out of these presentations, um, then you have been successful in listening to them. Um, what they have tried to do is really get practical information to everyone, practical tips that you can really use and bring home to base camp, whatever your um, actual profession is in healthcare touching it in any event. And what I want to talk about today is the diversity issue that we are seeing in life. The world is becoming boundless. So we have people who work remote from all over parts of the world. We touch it in every day of our lives. And to appreciate diversity as we become in various roles, regardless of title, we touch a life in the workplace. And we have to be very sensitive to it. And I wanted to really just help everyone understand a little bit the difference between diversity and what is termed innovation and disruption. And we're seeing diversity in the workplace now more than ever because particularly in healthcare, we're plopping best practices from other successful industries, like in the banking industry. Has anyone ever gone to the, a bank machine and gotten an extra $20 bill? Never. Right? We need that same set of precision in healthcare to reduce medication errors and dispensing and things like that. So as we see more and more people coming into healthcare, we've got to appreciate differences. I'm not saying lower standards because we all will be at the same standards, but it's the appreciation of being different. And that's a hard concept for healthcare in particular because healthcare has been founded upon everyone assimilating. The outliers, the naysayers, the squeaky wheels generally were, were reprimanded versus rewarded. Hence our healthcare situation today because everybody had to create consensus. And if we had one outlier saying, no, that's not going to work, we thought they were the squeaky wheel and we either removed them, booted them, did something negative to them versus having them better reflect what they're trying to say and bring it forward to a group of people who really would perhaps benefit from it. So diversity is, is an unlikeness and it's a positive. It could be a negative, but it's a positive and it's an assortment of various, of various entities, skills, uh, every known noun. Innovation is a modernization, an alteration. Thinking, we always say thinking outside the box, but in fact it's thinking what else. Innovative thoughts are not necessarily um, bad, they're always good because they're making someone else think. Sort of like Jack Welch 101, you don't want people around you agreeing with you, you want someone around you who's going to challenge you to ensure that you've exhausted the path that you're about to take. And I think healthcare is really seeing that now because we're seeing a lot of these startup companies, these you know companies that have a great idea and now they're trying to infuse it into healthcare. The bad part of that is it's not being flushed out and it's not being really positioned correctly and perhaps a little redundant. And disruption. Disruption is a radical change in the industry of something. It could be a strategy. A disruption really makes you want to think. And I think in healthcare we're going to see that more and more because I said it in a previous um, comment that we have so much technology, so much innovation, so much approaches. And at the same time we have to flush them out. We have to ensure without jeopardizing progress ensure that what we infuse into healthcare is really going to make a difference. Our budget in healthcare has a lot of um, uh, reflections of why it is what it is. Particularly, we're taking care of chronic diseases that, you know, once the horse is out of the barn, the best thing you can do is just keep it in the pasture versus it progressing. So we've got to maintain a person's wellness as long as possible. Here's employment by the numbers. I really want everyone to sort of focus on it because as we see more and more people coming into healthcare, there's a, an action that people have a skill that we need. 
and it could be a variety of skills. But more importantly, as we see the age shift, there is between, you know, the baby boomer generation and people who no longer really need to retire, um, we're going to see a very diverse population. We're becoming a nation of gender neutrality and hopefully age neutrality because as we all age together, we have professions, we have skills, we have expertises that, you know, how many times have we heard someone say, gee, I don't want to retire, I'm going to uh, be bored. I'm I could play golf every weekend, but Monday through Sunday, really? So we're seeing a shift. Number one, our economy, people have to increase their you know, retirement because of Social Security and all those other issues. Financially, they want to keep working, but socially, we find there's an awful lot to give back. So as we become more sensitive in healthcare, I'm not saying to, to show preferential treatment to any age group. So long as the skills are there, we have to really pay attention to what who's in front of us. And I think that's going to be more sensitive. You know, um, All in the Family used to be a popular show when I was a kid. And it was really out there saying derogatory things. That, that, but at that point, it wasn't. Now, some of those phrases and things are sensitive to our cultures. Because remember, as we talk about the employment environment, what's sensitive to me may not be perceived as sensitive to you. So as you approach health care and we start seeing more different um, faces that are supplying it, supporting it, delivering it, the appreciation of regardless of all of those factors, if they have the skills that we need, we need to culture, nurture, and really empower them to do what they're best at. But here's just you know some example by the numbers of really the projected labor force. In healthcare, there is a dire need for experienced workers. Not just like the nurses who are invaluable to us at the bedside. Regardless of what any technology person says, if, if I am <coughs> diagnosed with terminal cancer, I don't want a robot or I don't want anyone else telling me I have six months to live. I want to see the eyes of the person telling me that so I can feel that. There's no replacement for the human being and the human touch. And I think that's a very um, invaluable statement. And with that, we are seeing that people want to work later in their life. And their life expectancy, because of health care and how we can keep individuals alive longer with intervention, is increasing. So we're seeing, as I gave an example, um, and you can see, Jennifer Lopez, 50 years old. Tom Brady wants to play football till he's 45. Christy Brinkley looks hot in a bikini at 67. You're seeing people who are change agents. These are empowerments that people could say, if you can get to where you want to be and stay healthy, you have a reason to give back to society. And that's where we're going to start seeing in healthcare because we have people who have skills that we still need because we cannot fill those voids. And technology alone cannot do that. If anyone says an electronic health record is going to replace someone to give them you know, their lab results, we see people who have patient portal access. They don't want to go onto the computer. They want the doctor and the nurse practitioner telling them their lab value. We can't get past that. But employment by the numbers, we are going to see changes in many of the faces and a lot of the activity that we see. And that's good because that's going to rev up people to start thinking of what we should be doing in healthcare. I really think that as we get over in this abundancy of all the technology, again, it's the people factor. And if you walk out of this room and think of the simple two little facets of appreciating someone who's sitting next to you and really understanding we could all learn from each other, Regardless of title, anyone can be a mentor to anyone. And I say that you can be a mentor of what to do and a mentor of what not to do. 
And, you know, there are times when we see that we always want to go to the highest level for someone to be our mentor. My best mentors were people who were in the secretarial roles. Um, cleaning people who at, at night were doing the cleaning and I would say, gee, I can't get in front of so-and-so. And they would tell me their hours. So, well, he comes in at 8 o'clock. It's the appreciation of others and the people. All of those skills, the people skills, need to come back into healthcare. It's easy to justify penalizing clinicians and physicians. It's so easy to judge people in roles. But it's the openness and starting to visualize how different things can be. And we are seeing in labor statistics, people are interested in numbers. By the year 2024, um, the labor force will grow to about 164 million people, and that number includes 41 million people who will be at the age of 55 and older, of whom about 13 million are expected to be the age of 65 and older. Now that's very important because healthcare already has a shortage. Shortage of nurses. People don't want to be doctors anymore because there's no reward in it. And that's tragic. And what we're seeing is shortages everywhere. So we have got to nurture and figure out people who are already good at something and infuse them into the profession. And that could be any, any form and any job description, if you will, of the profession. But if you notice, we have the millennials. Now I will give you a perfect example. Um, we had a millennial who was a phenomenal coder. He was 28, he was from MIT, he was brilliant, I mean brilliant. And um, he coded, he was making about 185,000, he lived in his car, and he had a dog, and he was absolutely, we relied on him intently. He walks in on a Thursday and says, I broke up with my girlfriend, I'm quitting my job, I'm putting a knapsack on my back, and you'll see me maybe in a year. And he was gone, and we had a boy. So we had to figure out, like, okay, how can we nurture? Our mistake was he should have mentored all the people around him to say, this is how I'm thinking, this is how I'm doing. Unfortunately, most of the people were over 50, and they had, like, a cultural. They couldn't understand each other. And I think we got to get to the point where we <coughs> level set and we start opening our minds. And we're going to see that more and more as we try to figure out healthcare and specifically, but also other, other in environments where people may not be an exact fit, but they're somebody that we can train and nurture. The key to any successful minimal attrition rate is to want someone to stay in their role and be around the people they work with. People leave their job because they can't stand the people they work with. More than anything else, if you, they get a job because they want to know the environment. They leave a job because I can't stand going to work today. My stomach is crawling because of A, B, C, D. So we've got to, as leaders, as people, start appreciating and opening our minds of what's in front of us, culturally, and all of those other facets. And what I wanted to do is give you some 10 simple examples that you could bring back to base camp to say, okay, I could do this, I could do this. And to be a change agent is very hard. It, particularly healthcare is extremely dogmatic. People go in, as a pharmacist, we're the most dogmatic people, profession of all of the healthcare. I really believe it because very rarely when I went into the boardroom, I never met a chief pharmacy officer. I met a chief nursing officer, chief medical information officer, I, I not to this day ever met a chief pharmacy officer. So that's our problem as a profession because we, I believe, opening our minds and now we rely on technology a lot. But here's some 10 simple examples that you can use and think about regardless of your title and regardless of your position. I always said to people, I always did the right thing regardless of the personal or social consequences. Because at the end of the day, you have to sleep with yourself. At the end of the day, if you know, when I worked at hospice, people always remember, gee, I don't know why I screwed George. I shouldn't have fired him. I should have, you know, kissed Ralph when I didn't. All these personal, emotional-based things. 
No one remembers, oh God, I love that car. Oh, I should have bought a bigger house. I should have. It's the emotional bound, binding um, uh, force that really creates a difference in the professions. I'm not saying the lovey, touchy thing. I'm saying the passionate respect for each other. And we're going to need to see that as we see the different faces approaching. So we've got to work with what we have. At the end of the day, we have to work with what we have. And as leaders, and all of us are leaders regardless of the title, because each of us has our own place. Um, here are some pearls that if you think of, you, and you bring them and infuse them into your process. Some of these are very difficult. Some of these you have to, you know, swallow and walk away. I remember when I turned 40, my mother died of breast cancer, and I used to wear a pink ribbon. And I always used to lose the damn thing. So what happened was I got a tattoo. And then people would always say, oh, Helen, were you drunk? Were you, and they're like, yeah, like, whatever you think. Because I didn't need to prove it to anybody. I just knew who I was. And I say that to everybody as individuals and as human beings working in healthcare. We bring something to it, whether you're, whether you're on the technical side, the vendor side, the patient side. At the end of the day, we're all consumers. How would you like to feel if you were laying on that cot, as our previous speaker said, and you know people walking by said, "Hey, Joe, how are you?" And that could be you. First one: communicate and ensure your audience understanding of what you are saying and delivering in your messages. Black and white messages are very distinct and very simple. Say it like it is. How many times have we gotten, gotten into a meeting and they're dancing around the bush? Say it. It's powerful because regardless of who the person is in front of you, if the message is clear and succinct, it will be understood. Build awareness and communicate the importance of, of conscious and unconscious bias. We all walk into it, we have to admit it, we all have a bias of something. Some are more aggressive than others, but it's our human nature. We are all biased towards something. It's so easy to criticize and so hard to appreciate. And I think it's the simple innuendo. <coughs> it doesn't even have to be a word. It could be a look. You've got to start appreciating how you are perceived. Because remember, it's not what you think you are. It's what other people view you as. You know, your mother used to say, like, oh, it's a first impression. It's that first impression. In our subconscious, in our evolution as who we are today as human beings, that created our survival. So that, that first glimpse really was our survival. But it will be your downfall in the workforce. A simple little hmm can be taken many different ways. I'm going to put my glasses on. This is very glary. Um, pay attention and embrace cultural differences, including cultural holidays and physical comfort in the work environment. You hire people for their skills. Some people have, I don't even want to use the word fetishes, but, but, but things in there that they need. I'm not saying unusual or um, things that are inappropriate or things that would be disruptive to others. I remember going for a job interview in San Diego. I was just finishing in Boston. And I went in with a suit, you know, typical Boston look. And I walk in and I had like three or four different interviews and I finally made the final cut with me and someone else. I go in there and say, I got it, I got it. And it was really from a, for a very big um, organization. I walk in there, everybody is in shorts, thongs, and has their dog next to their desk. And here I am walking in with a wool suit. Obviously, you know, I love dogs. And I should have wore something, but I, I didn't know my culture. I didn't know what I was walking into. And I blew it, because I would have loved that culture. 
So what I'm saying is every day as you walk in, forget your biases and walk in with an open mind because it's very powerful. <clears throat> Offer diversity and cultural awareness training. If you're in an environment and you see energy, and I just say energy, it doesn't have to be, again, you don't have to be the leader of the shop. It's the energy. You don't need to carry it any further. But as we appreciate and as we see, I always say to my students, I'm like, close your eyes, forget you're in Boston. You're anywhere in the world. Figure how you should behave. Because your intelligence will set you free. The one thing that anyone can learn or give a gift to anyone in the world is an education because that's something you can work with your whole life regardless if you have to start from scratch or you can prosper to whoever you want to be. It's an education. I'm not saying a book education as much as mentoring, understanding, educating, and learning skills that will be invaluable to you as a person that you can then bring forward. Healthcare needs this innovation. Healthcare needs this diverse thinking. Because what happened is everybody drank the Kool-Aid. So one person was the maverick for whatever reason, and everybody replicated, saying, well, Joe does it there, and they do it here, and let's do it here. And then we have this conglomerate, and no one's any healthier than <coughs> they were 10 years ago when the doctor used to say, uh, Joe, you're overweight, start exercising. You can't tell anybody really anymore they're overweight. We were young, it wasn't pleasant, but people would say, you know, you're fat, start walking. You know, inappropriate now, but when it was 40 years ago, people would say, yeah, you know what, I am. So we have to be sensitive now because things are changing. That is where healthcare is going. All the technology in the world is not going to stop human nature from setting in and causing havoc. Make it easy for employees to mingle, including mixing up teams with age, race, and personalities. This is very important. We avoid cliques at all costs. Break up cliques. They're destructive. They're hurtful. And they are counterintuitive to innovative ideas. It's like ganging up when you were kids and everybody ganged up on you. How did you feel? Right? That's what happened in healthcare. Because we had maybe a room of 30 people. We'd go in, the vendors, for instance, for electronic health records, would go in and do their spiel. And they're like, yeah, 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 yeah. And then there was someone back there was like, oh, no, they have to do this, 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 this. What do we do? They put, we put them in the corner. And then it's like, OK, he's just like the squeaky wheel. He always squeaks. But his idea was probably right. And look where we are today. Lack of interoperability, meaning if you, wherever you are, the data isn't miraculously cleaned and transferred. And by the way, these are all my own opinions, so you take it under advisement, but this is coming from me, so I should put that disclosure in there um, as well. Create timelines with explanations, ensuring understanding by all of the end game. Regardless of who the person is, or what age group is a directive. By March 31st, at 4 o'clock, close of business, we will have the following. And stick to it. If there's extensions or some uh, reasonable reason why, you just make it simple and clear. There's no, there's no wiggle rooms. The more you have as a timeline of decisions, and the more for deadlines, be consistent. It's very powerful. So as you come to a millennial, as you come to someone who's 65, 67, we have some uh, a consultant who's 74 and is rocking it with all his Gantt charts. We need people. And it doesn't matter who's in front of you, so long as the skills are what we need, they're respectful, they're considerate, and they're professional and ethical. Those are the things you cannot compromise on. Anything else, fair game. We did have a, a, an engineer who, you know, didn't take a bath for a month, literally. 
He was brilliant. And I'm just saying as examples. So everybody started, boy, what's that smell? What's that smell? And I simply walked up and said, look, we have hygiene here. Just remember what hygiene stands for. Said it to the whole room of everyone. No one was so secluded out. He was smart enough and he got it. Okay? We don't need to, we don't need to pigeonhole or shun anyone because we need these individuals. Pair individuals together synergistically, accentuating and encouraging diverse skill sets. In healthcare, again, we always have people like, yeah, 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 yeah. Jack Welsh 101, I want the people around me who will challenge my decision and tell me why I'm wrong and you feel you're right objectively. Creep out the emotions, creep out the energy, tell me why your decision is better than mine. I want people like that. Some of the best projects that we have ever worked on were for people saying, well, wait a minute, let me think about this, and here's why we should do it this way. Not pontifications of getting down and just like, really? Give me your two-minute elevator speech of why you're right or more right than I am. Draw in that. It's very powerful. It gains respect. And you meet a lot of great people along the way. If, if nothing else, I want to be able to be in a supermarket and walk up to everybody and say, hey, how are you? Very powerful, the human side of healthcare. Before making a decision, listen to both sides of the argument, regardless of title or age. As we come into healthcare, more and more, even in, in not even healthcare, in any business entity. Generally, I found the first person who came and squealed was the culprit, right? But they got to you first. More and more decisions have been made under the wrong circumstances. When you have conflict in the work environment, listen to both sides. And ironically, sometimes you don't have to like the person. That's a misconception. You know, I gotta like this person. No, you don't. You gotta respect them if they're ethical in your book, if they have a skill set. I may not like you as a person, you know, make sure they didn't do anything illegal, but you know, we have this like factor going. I don't like what he's doing, I don't like it. Put that aside. That's independent of business. Now people will argue with me on that topic. I've worked with a lot of people who I would say is a jerk. They weren't abusive, they were just like, I don't know. I just don't like you. You're just, I don't know. You didn't say thank you to the waitress. Like, I don't know why I don't like you, but I don't like you. It should not affect your business decisions. Your business decisions should be the swim lane with which you make choices that benefit the common good. That's the difference. And having people, you know, I call it the Jerry Springer effect. Sometimes you have people and they're like, then, and then, and then. It's like, Okay, you know, this is Jerry Springer stuff. Let's get back to the basics. Happens everywhere. can be all the way from the top down. You get past it, you move through it, and you basically, you figure out what you need to do. Blow the whistle and say, time out. This is Jerry Springer. I have no interest in this. What's our decision? Everybody go back to their corners. That's going to be the work environment now. We're not, we don't want people all assimilating and drinking the Kool-Aid. I want somebody to say, no, we need it this way because the consequences downstream will be this. Like, Wait a minute. Yes, that's right. I don't want someone to say, yeah, Helen, great idea, great idea. Now let's go to lunch. No, because five years from now, the company will tank because of that decision that wasn't challenged. So you always got to think downstream of your consequences. Not today, not tomorrow, not a year from now. Where do you want to be? And I always say that to a lot of startups that I consult for. It's like, where do you want to be in <coughs> five years? That's where you want to end up. So how do you get there? Make everyone feel special in their own way. Get the like factor front and center. We see people who appreciate things in different lights based on their age group. Millennials think differently. 
than our senior population. Tell me, 55 and older senior now in the terms that we see, because, you know, 49, I got my AARP card. I'm like, what? But you know what? It's got A and A, so it's cheap. Um, but the practical sense is we're seeing all this. And we have to be liked enough to be respected. I'm not saying like us to the point of being our friends. Appreciate what we're trying to do. And I think the more your, diverse t your team is diverse, the more that you will get used to the fact that our culture is changing. So what we used to see in healthcare, we're no longer. A lot of things are remote now, a lot of things are tele, a lot of things are technology, and we're seeing who's behind those screens. So I think, if nothing else, the appreciation of being different. Not being, and again, I stress, you have to be ethical, you have to be legal, you have to be professional, and all of those factors, but outside, to be able to really appreciate it. And employees work remote, have weekly FaceTime and routine recognition. This is very important now because we have a lot of remote workers and we forget about them. It's like, oh, Joe's on the conference call. Well, we haven't talked to Joe in you know, two weeks. Make weekly contact. Hey, how are you doing? How are you doing? What's going on? Very powerful because a lot of healthcare is turning remote. Our help desks, our contacts, our um, expertise of our second opinions, a lot of things are happening that way. But if you have a remote employee, pay attention to them as if they were in your backyard. With that, I want to say two statements that I always tell my students. I don't, you know, really give lectures in the industry. I've worked for three Fortune companies successfully, and there's two things that I always say. If good people do nothing, that is evil enough. You know the old saying, you know, if you in the subway, see something, say something. You got to do it in a positive way because that is powerful. And copying is the highest form of flattery. At the end of the day, if somebody's copying what you do, say you're in the workforce and some, you know, Joan is already, you know, doing your hair do or something. Copy. Highest form of flattery. And mentoring is ageless. Everyone can learn from everyone, regardless of title. And remember, mentoring could be learning what to do and what not to do. People always want to get a mentor like, I want to be like you someday. I used to get a mentor saying, I need to be how what you are doing, the skills and things like that, which is far more powerful. I've had a lot of black eyes of what I shouldn't have done or shouldn't have you know, um, broken the glass, if you will. But I could sleep at night knowing I never hurt anyone. And that's, if you can go home and say, I never hurt anyone, and you have a conscience, unless you're a sociopath, you would say, okay, I did good today. That's what you have to do. And again, I can't say it enough, but jo I, you know, avoid the Jerry Springer drama. Healthcare is having it. We all have it in industry, it's human nature. But at the end of the day, these little tricks and pearls can help you in the workforce. It's very, very um, powerful. So that's, that's our, our uh, talk. And if you have any, I know we have to go eat food. Um, but um, if you have any suggestions or anything, um, please feel free and you could reach to me um, however you like. All right? Thank you so much. Thank you.